Last week we were talking about courage. Faith exhibits courage. And looking at Joshua and the Israelites as they move into the promised land. In Hebrews chapter 11, the verse we had come to as we were studying that book speaks about a lady by the name of Rahab. And the faith that she exhibited in her life. And she's a very unusual lady. Faith, um, if we wanted to have a title, I thought of several things. We could say faith has legs, faith has teeth, faith has action, faith has a price tag. All those things you could kind of think about when you think about Rahab and her life. But just to give you a little background, the Israelites now have been out of Egypt for about 40 years. The old guards died off. The new guard is in, and Joshua is the leader. In fact, on our little map up here, Mount Nebo is right here. And that's where Moses went up on a mountain and died after the Lord let him at least see the promised land from afar. So the Israelites are about in this area, just north of the uh, Dead Sea, on the east side of the Jordan. They got across that Jordan to get into the Promised Land. You think, well, that's no big deal. Well, at that particular time of the year, um, it would really flood its banks and be pretty turbulent. Uh, now it doesn't happen today because the Israelites, I mean, not the Israelites, but the Israelis, dammed the river to control it. But they're going to cross this, this river and they're going to go, and, and particularly they're going to start off in this little town called Jericho. And that's where they're going to start their conquest. And it's going to last about seven years. You can see all the, the different people. They're going to have to um, fight the Hittites, the Parasites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergalites. I don't know. It's something like that. The Hivites. Uh, a lot of ites. Over here is the Jebites, Jebusites. Um, they will not be conquered until later on. There's going to be an infamous guy by the name of King David later on who will take Jerusalem um, there in that place. So they've got some formidable foes. The only training they've had is read your Bible, basically. Trust God. And they're not going to conquer this land and dispossess it from the other folks because they have uh, done really well in target practice. It's because they're going to trust the Lord. It's going to be by faith. Because God spoke to Abraham um, about uh, close to 600 years prior to this time. And he said that God was going to give it to him and his descendants. And so now that promise is being partially fulfilled. Because they're only going to take about 10,000 square miles out of about 300,000. Someday that promise will be totally fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ. Um, but uh, that promise is still uh, good, as all God's promises are. Well, so Joshua uh, decides to send out a little reconnaissance party before they endeavor to, uh, to undergo their military campaign. And so he sends out two spies. You remember the last time, 38 years prior, Moses sent out 12. And we remember how that went. So Joshua said, I think we'll just send two this time. And I'm sure that he really um, put those two under some rigorous um, leadership training because it's critical how they come back and the report that they give back. Because Joshua is, he's vivid in his memory what happened uh, just a while back. And leadership is important. It's important who we choose for leaders. Um, the Bible says that um, we'll have to give more of an accounting of ourselves before God than everybody else because everybody's watching us. So you could say we really have to watch our P's and Q's. 
So he sends two guys out, and we don't know everywhere they went, but they went to, we do know, they went to Jericho. And in uh, Jericho, you remember this is the Old Testament Jericho. There's a New Testament Jericho, and there was an infamous guy there. You remember who his name was? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Remember that? That's where he was. But that's a long time after this. Jericho is inhabited, and all, of, all these cities have been inhabited by, by just wicked people. These, God told Abraham that he was going to wait and allow the Israelites to stay in Egypt for over 400 years in captivity, giving all these people in Canaan time to repent. Well, they didn't do it. And so, God's patience has its limits. Judgment Day will come. We know the Bible says this. And judgment is going to come for these people in Jericho. Well, these two spies, uh, they show up in this place, and we pick up the story in Joshua chapter 2. So, let's just read a little bit of this, okay, to give you a little bit of the story, and then we'll just talk about a couple of things that maybe we can draw from it. So, they arrive um, in Jericho, verse 1, and so they went, came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and lodged there. They're thinking that this is a place nobody's really going to look for them there. But it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. And so the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them. And so she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark, the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them, pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. And the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. Verse 8, Now there before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has, uh, has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites and Og. Verse 11, And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And so the men answered her, Our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Go this way into the mountain. And she gave them instructions how to avoid the pursuers. And then we learn in chapter 6, after they attacked and uh, were about to attack the city, Joshua said in verse 22, chapter 6, to the two men had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. And so they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. So, Rahab is what we would call a bad lady. In fact, we really just going to call her a sinner. And you know what God does with sinners who have faith in Him? He turns them into saints. You see, God is, is giving us this illustration of Rahab's life not because he's interested or wants us to be interested in the before, but he wants us to be interested in the after. Because when God gets a hold of you, the after is going to change, and it's going to change on the inside, which is going to flow onto the out, into the outside. 
Rahab, um, these men come in. Some people think that, you know, that she really wasn't a harlot, that she was an innkeeper. No, the Hebrew word is such that it's written, just as it's written. But maybe she had already given up her profession, we don't know, because she was, had flax, drying flax out on her roof to make some money. Because the, what we do know is that she had heard about the God of the Bible and she believed in Him. She had faith. And her faith was exhibited. It had legs. It had teeth. Because the king had heard that these two men were hiding out in the closet in her house. And he asked her about it. And what did she do? Did she tell the truth? No, she lied, didn't she? The Bible says that um, thou shalt not bear false witness, right? No, it says you shall not bear false witness. The Bible wasn't written in 1611 language. There's no thou. It's you. In fact, the Ten Commandments in Hebrew is not the Ten Commandments. It's the Ten Words. The Ten Words that God gave to His people. One of those words is that you shall not bear false witness. But she did, didn't she? Boy, I mean, people really have trouble. The preachers have trouble when they get to this part. Because she did a good thing by doing a bad thing. Well, let me ask you, what would you have done if you had faith in God? And you knew that these, it was critical that these two guys got back to the people of God and gave them a good report. What would you have done? I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have lied. You know what you call that? The lesser of two weevils. No. The lesser of two evils, right? No, it's not right to lie. But you know why most people lie? It's because they're trying to save their own skin. But whose skin is she trying to save? Not her own, the two spies. In fact, if she wanted to save her own skin, she would have told the truth. Yeah, they're right over there in the closet. Just go fetch them out of there. No, because she lied to protect those two spies, if she had been found out, what do you think the king of Jericho would have done to her? He'd have strung her up in two seconds. Man, she took great risk in the faith that she had. And it's incredible. When you look at this woman... Here in Joshua, uh, as we read in verse chapter 6, and then in Matthew chapter 1, and then in Hebrews chapter 11, and then in James chapter 2. It's amazing. In this chapter right here, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he wrote this epistle. There's only two people he mentions in his whole epistle. One of them is Abraham. The other one is Rahab. Anytime you're mentioned in the company of Abraham, I'm telling you, you're doing all right. Wow. Unbelievable. He talks about her faith. The hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not easy to make that chapter. Of all the people in scriptures, there's only a few of them mentioned there. And Rahab makes it. And on top of that, she's a woman. Wow. Because women were second class citizens in Bible times. On top of that, Matthew chapter 1. She's listed as one of the four women in the pedigree of Jesus Christ. And you know who Matthew's writing this book to? Jews. Man, you don't mention women in your pedigree. If, if they would have done that to somebody, they would have just burned it up with fire immediately. You just shamed them. It gives such authenticity to the New Testament because Matthew did this. Because he wrote these four women in here. If, if he was, a, if he was a, a guy trying to pull the wool over our eyes, he wouldn't have mentioned four women. He would all had men in there. One of those women, Rahab. In fact, Rahab and her family, we'll talk about that in a second, they escape um, Jericho. By the way, Jericho has been excavated. This is Old Testament Jericho, not New Testament Jericho. And they, when they excavated it, they found out that they had two walls, not one. They also found that there were many houses on stilts built between the two walls. 
And guess who lived in one of those houses? As the Bible tells us, Rahab. She lived on the city wall. When they excavated, they also found out that the, the walls, when they fell, they fell outward, not inward, just as the Bible tells us. Nevertheless, Rahab, she gets saved. By the way, grace works the same way in the Old Testament as it does in the New Testament. The Bible says, and Abraham believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. This woman, she believed God before she ever proselyted in the Israel, Israel faith, in the Israel covenant. She believed God. That's how we're always saved. It's not by doing this or doing that or joining the church. It's by saying, I believe in you, Lord Jesus, and I accept you in my life. I trust you to come in. I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me. I want you to be my Savior. That's what every single one of those people who got baptized today had already done. They had already asked Jesus to come into their life. They were just given a visual aid because nobody can see God come into your life. We accept it by faith. So Rahab, what a story. She marries a guy by the name of Solomon. What tribe do you think he was from? Judah. And they have a baby, and their baby is Boaz. And he marries Ruth. And they have a baby. And their baby's name is Obed. And Obed has a baby. And his baby's name is Jesse. And Jesse has a baby. And his baby's name is David, who will later take over Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And then David will have a baby and 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 a baby. And finally, a thousand years later, in a little town called Bethlehem, you'll have a baby by the name of Jesus. And Jesus came from where? Rahab. You know what God's after? He's not after the before. He's after the after. Okay? You know something about Rahab? You know, I, um, if you were hiding Jews in your house from the Germans, and they came in and asked you, where are they? Are you hiding them? Would you say, oh, go open up the closet? No, you wouldn't do that. You'd want to, you want to spare their lives. You want to help them. We live in a world that is not perfect. Everybody understand that? I mean, we have thorns and thistles and hurricanes and storms and, you know, car wrecks and all kinds of stuff. This is the world we live in. We're trying to trust the Lord to help us to do the best that we can. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a pacifist in World War II, and he had to come to the decision whether he would participate in the assassination attempt of Adolf Hitler. He came to the decision that he was going to participate because it was better to try to assassinate Adolf Hitler before Adolf Hitler killed millions of people. This is the world we live in. It's just not picture perfect. We're trying to understand. And God is going to commend this woman because of her faith. And I'll tell you something she did. When, when she addresses the spies, she says, oh, I want you to remember me now because I did this for you because I believe in your God and I know you're going to conquer this city. But what else did she say? But not just me. I want, you to, I want you to save my mother and my father and my brother and my sisters and all my relatives. You see, she was concerned about her family. You see, that's what happens to somebody when they really get saved. When they really get saved, say, man, I don't want to go there by myself. I want my mama to go, my daddy, my brothers, my sisters. I want all my kinfolk to go. Well, I don't want all of them to go. <laughs> just, just most of them. You know, the Bible says that uh, when 
Israel came to conquer the city and they went to get Rahab, you know, who was waiting there with her? Her mama and her daddy and her brothers and her sisters and all her family. She had gathered them all up. You see, because what happens when you become a Christian? This, this part here, God changes your life. He starts transforming your life. Now, how does he do that? He does that on the inside first. That's what he does. And when he starts changing on the inside, it starts manifesting itself, what God's doing on the inside, on the outside. In other words, when God came into my life, I started caring about people besides Mike. Before that time, I really could just, I was just out for number one. I was just looking out for me. I was just, it was just all selfish. Now, I'm not saying that lost people, people in our Christians, can't do good things. They can. They can help people. We see people do that all the time. But I'm talking about my nature. I'm talking about what the common thread in my life, you know. It was selfishness. It was all about me. But man, when God came into my life and he started talking to me about the love that he had, not just for me, but for my mother and my father and my, I didn't get any brothers. All I got was sisters. You know how rough that is? It was terrible. Losing all my stuff, getting in my stuff. But God worked through all that. He said, you need to love your sisters. I, I loved them, kind of. <laughs> but man, I wanted to tell them. I, wanted, I started telling them. Did, did they believe me right off? No, they didn't. My dad yelled at him, don't yell, yell at me, don't talk to me about God. That was his first response. My sister, older sister said, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. What did they need to see? Not just what I was saying, they needed to see some transformation in my life so that my talk would measure up to my walk. And it didn't take very long. And they started seeing Mike's life change. And one by one, they got knocked down like dominoes. Just like Rahab's family. Now God is not only working in my life and in your life in order to get us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others, to be great commissioned Christians. And there are people that you know that are lost, that you need to ask the Lord to help you with a strategy to try to reach them. Maybe it's to give them a track and say, hey, how about just reading this sometime and thinking about it and letting me know what you think about it. Anybody can do that. How about praying for them? There's all kinds of things the Lord can do. And that's part of it. But God, He really wants to transform our lives, to change our lives. And I was talking about this last week when we spoke about that faith exhibits itself through courage. That's one expression. And the, another expression is self-control. The last fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Last week we said frustration is not a fruit of the Spirit. And what God's, many of God's people today, they're full of conflict in their lives. And it's no wonder people look at them and go, I don't really want you what you got. If that's what Christianity has to offer, when, when I see you all depressed and disappointed and down in the mouth and criticizing and, and complaining all the time and judging and, and, you know, all of that, why do I want what you have? That's why God wants to change the after. Okay? Now, last Wednesday uh, night, you know, there were seven or eight of us. And so I asked them, I said, how'd y'all like the sermon last Sunday? Tell me what you liked about it. Tell me what you remember. I waited about 10 minutes. <laughs> One particular lady, she, she remembered she did really well. The rest of them, they were kind of scratching their heads. Now, here's the problem. It wasn't that they weren't listening. 
Different messages affect different people sometimes. And what happens is, stay with me here, what happens is, is that you'll hear a message, you'll be in a Bible study, but if what's said doesn't connect in some way with some experience that you had, you probably are not going to hook on to it. You're probably going to, you're going to move on in your life. So what we need is we need hooks to help our memory banks. Wouldn't it be terrible if you learned a truth that God wanted you to learn today and by tomorrow you forgot it? Would that be good or bad? That'd be bad. That's not saying much for the after. Okay? What you need are hooks. Now here's what I do. Because believe it or not, people have said to me, I really liked your sermon, like, you know, on Thursday or Friday of last week, and I have to go, what in the world did I preach on? (laughs) I've done it too, and I'm the preacher. I'm just like you. There's so much information, and so much going on. Our lives are so busy. So here's what I do to help me, because I don't want to learn or hear a truth that God has for my life and then go forget it. What a tragedy. So, in my quiet time, as I'm learning things from the Lord, as I'm picking stuff up from my own sermons, <laughs> okay, I'm writing these down in my journal. And I am putting them in a, I'm writing them in a prayer so that I'm thinking about them and I'm praying about them, I'm confessing them. In other words, this is a truth that I know that God wants to live in my life. And here's what I'll do. And there are many truths. And I can't go over them, all of them, every single day. There are so many. In fact, there are 1,048 commands in the New Testament. Many of them repeat each other. But what I'll do is I'll say, as I'm trusting the Lord to make these a part of my life that particular day, Lord, I choose to endure in the Lord. See, I don't just choose to endure. I choose to endure in the Lord because strength. Remember last week, Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the, in the Lord and the strength of his might. Not, don't be strong in Mike, be strong in Jesus Christ. How are you strong in Christ? By making a choice, a faithful choice to live in the Lord. I choose Lord, for you to tame my tongue. And on and on it goes. And then I say, Lord, and I am trusting you to use what I have prayed about today, to use what I have trusted you to do. Now, I wrote this down first because if I have to rely on my memory, I'm in big trouble. Anybody else out there like that? There's a boatload of you. You guys have pen and paper, man. Write it down. Get your journal so that you can start reviewing this stuff on a daily basis. So I'll say, Lord, what I have prayed about today, my thing just disappeared, man. Wow. Wow, man, what? I don't want surface, man. Anyway, it's all right. That's okay. That's all right. So. I'm asking the Lord, Lord, now what I've prayed about today and what I'm confessing today, now when I have a circumstance that comes up in my life, use what I have trusted you for, bring that to my remembrance so that you can use that in my life. See, that, that's, that's working. That's working. Because what God's will for your life is, is for you to have the last fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. So that when the storm comes, the circumstance comes, the block goal comes, the person who talks about your mama comes, the, whatever the, the difficulty, whatever the tension, whatever the stress, uh-uh, I'm, I'm trusting you, Lord. You see, the Bible says that you own the earth and the fullness thereof. My hands are off. I'm taking my hands off of everything that's not my responsibility. I don't own nothing. 
I don't own any money. I don't own any cars. I don't own my family, my kids. I don't own this church. I don't own the ministry. I don't own nothing. You own it all. My job is to wait on you. And any of this bad stuff from the enemy or my flesh, oh, no, sir, I don't receive it. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to wait in you. And you know what will happen? You'll see Christianity really work on the inside. And you'll be calm. You'll have peace. And you won't have lots of inner conflict. You won't have frustration. You won't be unhappy. You'll be happy. In fact, one of my things in my prayer is I choose to be happy today. I choose to be thankful today. I choose to be joyful in the Lord today. Always in the Lord. This is my choice. Everybody has choices to make. You can cho choose to be to complain. You'd be full of conflict. You'd be full of frustration. I would suggest you take your hands off, man. Let God have all that stuff. He knows how to deal with it. Because do you know what God does? He's in the business of moving all the pieces around. Your job is to have the right response. Let him move the pieces. Let him do that. What happens is God will transform the after in your life. And that will show up in the inside. And when it starts showing up in the inside, it'll start showing up on the outside. And that is what God is after. And he can do it in your life because he did it in a lady's life by the name of Rahab. Let's pray. I just wonder if there's somebody here today who is not absolutely certain that if they were to die, they'd go to heaven. You say, oh, Brother Mike, I want to go. I hope to go. No, that's not good enough. The Bible says you can know that you're going. Absolutely no. So how can I know that? Because the Bible says you can. I have written these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He who has the Son has, present tense, eternal life. To as many as received into them, he gave the right to become the children of God. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and any man who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Whosoever shall believe, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, what do I need to do? Do I need to become a Baptist? Absolutely not. Do I need to get baptized? Do I need to, do I need to go to Sunday school? Do I need to be a good guy? No, you can't. The Bible says we've all sinned and we deserve death. And so Jesus knew that you couldn't get up to him, so he came down to you by way of a cross. And he took your place and paid for all your sins. But it's not enough just to know that in your head. You must receive him in your life. And you know what? That invitation stands today. And in fact, it stands right at this minute, right where you're seated. Jesus wants to come into your life right now. Let me help you. Invite him in. Pray this prayer with me to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. Forgive me. You know where I've been, Lord. You know all about my before. But, oh, God, change my after. Not only in this life, but forever. Lord Jesus, come into my life right now. Save me. Give me the gift of eternal life. And make me the kind of person you want me to be. Now, if you prayed that prayer in your minute, God made a promise, and he keeps his promises. And he just came into your life, and he's going to change your life. Now the time is to start reading your Bible, 
and praying and going to church and let God work in your life. And there are some who have made this prayer, maybe today, but maybe in the past as well. You've already asked the Lord to come in your life. You've done this in private, but you've never made your faith public like these nine who came today. We're going to have an invitation. The call is for you to say, Lord, I'm not ashamed that you live in my life. Father, help us today to make choices that agree with your will and command. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.